Hi geographers, welcome to this video about sand dunes, a really important depositional feature that we find at the coast. We're going to be examining today the features of sand dunes and their formation and then try and link that to some examples. First thing I'd like you to do is to consider the definitions or the meanings of these four key terms here. If you've studied sand dunes before, you might be familiar with some of these terms. If you haven't, don't worry, just pause the video now and have a go at trying to work out what you think each of these four words might mean. OK, so if we go through these key terms then, vegetation succession, this is the evolution or the development of plant communities at a site over time. So how the vegetation changes over time from what we call a pioneer species to a climax community. The word Samosea, that represents the name for the succession of vegetation which takes place specifically on sand dunes. Pioneer species are the first plants to colonise an area of bare ground. In the case of sand dunes, a good example of that might be marum grass, the grass which first colonises that bare sand. And then the climax community is the end point of succession, if you like. So a community of plants which has reached a steady state over time and the vegetation has evolved to this end point. And normally, in the case of the UK, that would be deciduous woodland. I'd also like us to consider the key ingredients for the formation of dunes. You can see a photo here which illustrates a classic dune system in the foreground and then the beach and sea in the background. And on the left hand side, we've got some key ingredients. Again, what I'd like you to do is let me just pause the video at the moment and see if you can try and explain why each of those ingredients might be important. OK, we're going to look at each of these ingredients in turn, and some of them are actually linked together, um, particularly the first two. So we can see in this photo that we've got a very large, flat beach. You can see that huge expanse of sand here, that classic kind of ridge and runnel foreshore. Um, you get a sense of the scale when you look at the size of the car and the people on the beach here. And also what we can associate with this beach here is a large tidal range. So what we can see at the moment is the water here is at the low water mark. OK, so the tide is out, maybe at a spring tide. We don't know for certain. And then you can get a sense of where the high water mark is going to be. Certainly this area of the beach that we can see in the foreground here is probably going to be where the water reaches at high tide. So we can see we've got a very large expanse of sand which is exposed at low tide. Now this is really important because the large flat beach and the large tidal range exposes a large amount of sand which allows that sand to dry out. That is really important that in order for dunes to form the sand must have the opportunity to dry out. If it doesn't dry out then it's not going to be able to be picked up and transported by the wind. You also need a plentiful supply of sand we have to remember that dunes represent a very large scale accumulation of sediment in the backshore area of the beach. So that sand could be transported. That sand could be transported either by constructive waves. We can see in this image here that a lot of the waves look quite long and low and relatively spaced widely apart. We can see that the beach is probably fairly gently sloping. So perhaps constructive waves are responsible for the transport of that sediment. Perhaps also longshore drift. So there may well be an area further down the coastline which is experiencing high rates of erosion and then that material is being transported through the sediment cell by longshore drift and then ending up as part of this beach here. Also potentially rivers bringing sediment down into the sea, but we need to have a large supply of sand. We also need an onshore wind. Okay, What we mean by an onshore wind is one that is blowing from the sea onto the shore. So in this case, the dominant wind direction actually needs to be coming in perpendicular to the beach um, in what we call an onshore wind. 
direction. Okay, That's because the wind has to be blowing the sand in the right direction. If the wind was blowing in a different direction, or it's blowing in lots of different directions, the sand is just going to get blown around all over the place and you're not going to have that concentration of sand in one place, which is really important for the development of a sand dune. An obstacle is really important. Now that could take a variety of forms. It could be a small pebble, some seaweed, a bit of driftwood, anything that's been washed up onto the beach by the waves. We need to have that obstacle to give the sand something to build up around initially. The sand can't build up around itself. It needs to have an obstacle that it's going to hit and build up around in order to start the formation of sand dunes. And then as we can see in the foreground of this photo, the dunes are covered by vegetation, a variety of different vegetation types here. And that vegetation is really important because it acts as an anchor to the sand. So it's helping to support and anchor those dunes in place. So all of these ingredients are important. What's also fundamental is that you are able to consider the relative importance of these ingredients. So as we go through this session, think about whether some of those ingredients hold more or less significance than others. Before we look at the specific stages of the formation of sand dunes, I just want us to have a little look at this diagram which picks out some of the changes. Perhaps you could pause the video at this point and just note down three or four observations of how the sand dunes change as we go inland. So as we go from the sea, 300 meters inland, what do we notice from this diagram about how the sand dunes change? First thing you might have noticed is the size of the sand dunes. So initially they are increasing in height, embryo and four dunes and yellow dunes increasing in height. And then actually they, they probably start to decrease in height because these areas of dunes towards the back are not getting as much sand as the dunes closer to the sea. So these dunes are almost being kind of starved of sediment at the back. So an increase in height of the dunes is important. You may also notice that we get more vegetation cover as we go inland and certainly also that vegetation starts to become larger and more complex and more developed. So we go from um, small pioneer species of the embryo dunes towards much more developed shrubs and plants and trees even towards the back of that diagram. Another thing you might have noticed is that the slacks, these are the depressions between the dunes, become more pronounced as we go further inland. And actually, as we get towards the back of that dune system, that they may start to intercept the water table and therefore start to fill with water. We'll look at that a little bit more later on in this video. A final thing you might have noticed is this difference between mobile and fixed dunes. And as we go further inland, those dunes are less likely to be changing shape and they're much more likely to be fixed and anchored in position by that vegetation. So let's have a look now at the specific sequence that creates a typical sand dune system like the one we've got in this diagram here. So we're gonna focus our attention down on the shoreline initially. And as we've said already, dunes need a certain set of conditions to form. This is why we don't find them on all beaches because the conditions needed to create sand dunes are relatively rare. So we need to have that large flat beach, as we mentioned before, because the sand needs to be able to dry out. There's gotta be a constant supply of material because it's being blown inland and we need new material to replenish it. We need a means of transporting that sand, which in this case is the wind, and we need that onshore wind to be blowing in the right direction. And we need somewhere for it to be deposited more quickly than it's eroded. And that's why things like obstacles and vegetation are important, because they help to speed up that process of deposition. The first stage in the formation of dunes actually takes place on the shoreline in what we call the strand line. 
you can see this line of seaweed that's been washed up by the waves in the video here. And that's a classic example of what we mean by the strand line. It's the line which marks the point where the waves have washed material up to on the beach. I'm sure you've all seen something like that when you've been to the beach, walking down towards the sea, coming across a line of seaweed and driftwood. And that's what we call the strand line. So along that strand line, we're going to have lots of obstacles. The sand is going to be drying out as well between high and low tide. And any of that debris like driftwood or seaweed, that's going to act as an obstacle. that The sand can build up around and start to form a very small mound of sediment. What will then happen to that mound of sediment, like we can maybe see here in the photo or here, is that that sand will be colonised by vegetation. When that happens, we refer to this dune as an embryo dune. We can see it's really, really small. It's maybe only a 10 or 20 centimetres high. It's maybe only a metre or so um, from front to back. But you can already see how certain vegetation species, particularly species like marum grass, which is a common pioneer species, has grown into the sand and is starting to help anchor that dune together. Marum grass, like many of the other pioneer species that we find on dune systems, is very, very specially adapted to living in, the, in these sorts of conditions. You can imagine just how dry that sand is. So marum grass needs to be adapted to be able to survive with very, very little fresh water. It's also got to be able to tolerate very high levels of salt. We have to imagine that the spray from the sea water or the the water from the waves itself coming up the beach is going to be transferring high levels of salt into these dunes and that means that most vegetation is going to really really struggle to survive. Marron grass is very specifically adapted to be able to survive those dry salty conditions. It's also very windy in this sort of environment and again the dune vegetation needs to be able to survive those kinds of conditions. The vegetation does two things to help stabilise the dune. The first thing it does is that the roots bind the sand together. So the roots of the vegetation grow down into the sand and they create a little mat of vegetation that the sand is going to build up around and they're going to help to anchor that sand in place. The second thing it does is that the stems of the vegetation above the ground are going to trap particles of sand as they're blown over the beach. The stems of the marum grass help to slow the speed of the wind down. That might make any sediment that's being carried by the wind fall out of suspension because the, the wind speed drops, so it can't, hasn't got the energy to carry the material anymore. So by slowing down the wind speed and also acting as a barrier, the stems of the grass are really important as well. Now we can get a sense from looking at this picture as to what happens next. The next stage of this from embryo dune to become a four dune or a yellow dune is that those embryo dunes need to merge together. They need to what we call coalesce. They need to join up okay, as, as they've increased in size, as the marum grass has trapped more and more sand the dunes are increasing in size and they then become initially what we call four dunes and then what we call yellow dunes. And we can see a classic example of a yellow dune in this photograph here, literally called a yellow dune because it still has a very yellow appearance. The sand is still very much dominant um, and the vegetation hasn't completely covered this dune yet. We can see that these yellow dunes are much taller, they're much larger features. Um, and they have this very, very distinctive form. So the windward side, that's the side facing the sea, that tends to be quite gently sloping. Um, and obviously that's shaped by the movement of the wind. And then the leeward side, that's the side facing away from the sea, that tends to be maybe a little bit steeper and a little bit more unstable. Again, just to remind you of a couple of key bits of terminology, the tops of the dunes are what we call crests and the depressions in between the dunes are what we call slacks. So we 
often find that by the time we've reached this stage, the dunes have developed a very distinctive crest and slack formation. The sequence of vegetation succession doesn't stop here though. What then happens is that over time, that yellow dune will become completely vegetated and therefore become fixed in place. What we call a fixed dune or a gray dune would have been, been formed. One of the other things that marram grass does to help this colonization is that it adds nutrients into the soil as it dies. So the marram grass will die and it will be broken down and decompose in the sand and that will add organic matter into the soil. Um, we call that organic matter humus and what that does is it helps to increase the amount of nutrients in the sand. It also helps to retain moisture and in turn what that will do is allow the vegetation to change over time and will move from marram grass into other species of grasses and shrubs and even um, then ending up at this situation where we have a climax community of either deciduous woodland or possibly in some cases heathland. We'll say a little bit more about that um, heathland example in a minute. Now what we can also find between these grey dunes in the slacks are areas that perhaps have intersected the water table. So depending on the height of the water table, some of those slacks in between the grey dunes um, may become quite damp or possibly even contain um, some standing water. We may even get the situation like we have here, where we actually get some ponds developing between the dunes in these slacks. Okay, so there's quite a lot of information on this slide, but I think this just really nicely sums up the variety of changes that we see along a sand dune system as we go from the shoreline inland. So we can see here that we've got the distance from the sea denoted going from maybe zero to 20 meters all the way up to maybe, you know, two and a half kilometers inland. We have to think about the time scale that it's taking for these dunes to form. So an embryo dune, they might be maybe only a few decades old, whereas some of the older dunes as we go inland, the heathland and the woodland, they could be nearly 500 years old or more. So we're talking about a long term time scale when we're thinking about the formation of sand dunes. This row denotes the soil colour and again this relates to the names of the dunes. So nearer the shoreline, the sand gives the soil a very yellow appearance and then as we add more organic matter, we start to see a transition to grey colour and then to a brown colour as well as we get that much further inland. Another thing that changes is the pH or the acidity of the soil. Nearer the sea, the soil is relatively alkaline. Okay, Remember a number above seven indicates an alkaline soil. And that's because, as it says below here, there's quite a high percentage of calcium carbonate. That calcium carbonate comes from things like shells that are in the sea and broken down, forming part of the sand, giving it its alkaline characteristics. We'll see that as we go inland, the acidity of the soil increases. So we're going lower down on the pH scale here. Okay, And again, that's because we're getting less calcium carbonate in there because the, the sea shells haven't made it that far inland. And also the amount of organic matter is increasing and that, that in turn also helps to increase the acidity of the soil. We mentioned this word earlier, humus. Humus represents organic matter within the soil and maybe only less than a percent of the, the soil in an embryo dune might be made of organic matter. And again, that links with species like um, marram grass or sea lime grass that we can see here. Those pioneer species, which are very, very well adapted to living in those conditions with very, very few nutrients in the soil. Over time, we can see how that percentage of organic matter increases you know, to maybe 20 or even 40%. Um, and that's helping to support that much more diverse range of vegetation. 
Okay, so we start to see the emergence of trees and shrubs as we move towards the back of that sand dune ecosystem. This aerial photograph here just shows quite nicely, I think, that transition from the strand line through um, the embryo and four dunes to the yellow dunes and then the more fixed dunes and even the heath or woodland which is found further away from the shore. I've put a link to a video in the description of this video which will take you to the Time for Geography website where there's a great explanation of this process um, and again you can see those different stages and it looks at the different vegetation all the way through that sand dune ecosystem so it's well worth um, going and watching that video either pausing this now or coming back to that at the end. As with all of our landforms it's really important that we have a located example and the example that we are going to use is Studland okay so at the far end um, of the Jurassic Coast um, these dunes began forming about 500 years ago. It's important to understand why Studland has sand dunes and that's partly because of how sheltered this part um, Studland Bay is from the prevailing wind and that's because of this headland here known as the foreland okay you might remember we talked about this when we looked at headlands and bays um, old Harry Rocks is here and this headland um, this chalk headland sticks out to sea and provides a lot of shelter to this part of the coastline so we've got the kind of conditions that we need nice constructive waves um, nice low energy environment here to be transporting sand some of it's brought along by longshore drift okay and we then are also experiencing that kind of onshore breeze in the right direction here as well so the dunes here have basically formed a barrier that separated Studland Bay from this freshwater lake here which is known as Little Sea okay um, so the dunes lie in this area between Studland Bay and this lake here Little Sea. At the northern end of the peninsula so up here around Shell Bay the dunes here are growing at a rate of about one meter every year and we've got the situation here where this peninsula here is over a kilometer wide so we've got a thousand meters of dune system quite nicely marked out following that classic um, sequence that we've been talking about earlier on. The thing that's unusual about the dunes in Studland um, is that the soil here is relatively acidic okay and that means that after about 60 years or so um, after the roots of the marron grass have anchored that sand in place and they um, have become more fixed dunes rather than becoming colonized by deciduous woodland we actually get um, heather colonizing uh, the dunes okay and that produces um, this dune heathland that we were talking about and it's a much rarer habitat actually than, than the deciduous woodland which normally perhaps is the climax community. So with more than 75 hectares of sand dunes um, Studland is actually the largest area of dune heath on the south coast and that's why it represents a very special environment and a very significant ecosystem which is quite heavily managed and well protected as well. You can see here if we look at um, this map of Studland we can see Little Sea down here that lake that we were talking about a moment ago and we can see here that transition from the wide sandy beach here into those dunes okay and then into that kind of heathland and woodland behind so that brings us to the end of our video about sand dunes make sure that you're happy with the sequence of events which takes place to create sand dunes make sure you're happy with the ingredients that are needed in order for them to form and make sure you're also confident with the meanings of some of those new bits of key vocabulary